Good evening and welcome to another edition of Contemporary Living with Farmer and Hill. I am one of your hosts, Andre Hill, and tonight we're going to talk about a very good topic. Um, actually, I was inspired by comedian Brian the Wildcat Smith. I was, he was texting the, um, what was that, Thursday night. Actually, he texted me Wednesday night promoting a movie that he has coming out. So I followed back up with him early Thursday morning, and as we was texting back and forth, and I was congratulating him, congratulating him on his trip to Africa, and he texts back and, you know, he was like, thank you, you know, God is fancy. And I'm like, hmm, God is fancy. That kind of uh, stuck with me, stuck with me. So I said, Brian, I'm going to kind of steal that title for my next lesson. So tonight's title is, oh, God fancy now, huh? So that's what we're going to talk about, how fancy God is tonight. Um, before I get started, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscription button at the bottom. Also, you can follow us on Facebook at Cont Contemporary Living with Farm and Hill. Also, you can also tune in to our show, Contemporary Living, each and every Thursday night on Comcast Channel 19 at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. So tonight's message is, oh, God fancy now, huh? So we're going to talk about fancy and, and God being fancy. And when you really think about it, the definition of fancy is feel a desire or liking for. It also means an elaborate, uh, it also means elaborate in structure or decoration. So you really think about God when he created the heavens and, and when God created the earth. You think about how God was elaborate and how he was detailed and how God just structured the heaven and the earth. And when you look around today's world, you see God, his work within us. If you look at the skyscrapers, you look at men traveling to the moon and, and you look at men traveling and, traveling into Mars. Um, as you see cars that drive itself, you look at the internet, you look at the Wi-Fi, you look at cell phones, all the things around us that we neglect, we fail to realize how fancy God really is. And not only that, when we look at man, we got to look at the wisdom of God because God has put his wisdom in each and every one of us. So tonight we're going to talk about God being fancy. Oh, God, fancy now, huh? So God is fancy in everything that he do. We, we look at God, we say he's good and he's great and he's awesome and he's wonderful. And tonight we're going to talk about how fancy God is. And tonight's message is dedicated toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we are appreciative. We are thankful for everything that he does for each and every one of us. We thank God for the blessings that he bestow upon each and every one of us. So as I get started tonight, oh God, fancy now, huh? We're going to look into the scriptures. For the Bible tells us as we get started in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightfully dividing the word of truth. So each time you come on to Contemporary Living, I, one thing I like about our show, we're going to give you substance and you're going to get a variety. I'm going to hit you with some spirituality and my wife going to hit you with some reality. So that's one thing you can get. It's like a buffet here. You can get whatever you want, whether you're dealing with real estate, whether you're dealing with stress, whether you need some, some biblical uplifting and knowledge, you can get it here at Contemporary Living. So we're going to talk about how fancy God is tonight as I go right into the scriptures. As we look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, for the Bible tells us in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And I like verse 4, show you how fancy God is. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And if you think about how awesome God is, he just spoke it. And it just happened. And so you look at how God created the heaven and earth and how it says in verse two, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. See, look, look, look how God fancy, how fancy God is as we, we look into God and who he is tonight as we dedicate this message to our Lord and Savior. And we're going to walk you all the way through the pages of time. I'm going to start from Genesis and just work you all the way to the New Testament. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, and it reads, And it came to pass after these things that God did, did tip, tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. 
verse 2 reads, And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into a, to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering unto one of the mountains which I tell thee of. So here we have it. We, we look at God in the beginning in his in his infinite wisdom as he as he created the heavens and the earth. And he just spoke it, spoken into existence. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. But as we go through the pages of time, we look at on, 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 in Genesis chapter two, verse one through two, we see that God tells Abraham to to go ahead and sacrifice your only son. As we as, as we move on, follow me now because I want to walk you through the time through the pages of history. And as we look at God and we look how fancy He is, and we look at how awesome He is, and we look at how He structured everything and how He planned everything accordingly. As we read on in Genesis chapter twenty-two, verse fifteen through eighteen, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and He said, "By myself have I sworn." said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and, that, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So it tells you how fancy and awesome God was. God was so great that he had to swear all by himself. There was none greater. So he had to swear by himself. You know, when we, we always say when we do something, I swear to God. Why do we swear to God? Because he's great and there's no one greater than he is. As we read on, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, 17 through 18, backs them up. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. But all the way through the pages of time, God had a better plan. And, he, and God is so faithful and just, he said, and I'm paraphrasing now, so I'm going to be paraphrasing throughout this message tonight. And, and God said, well, you know what? Since Abraham was going to sacrifice his son for me, I got a better idea. I'm going to send my son all the way through the pages of time, and I'm going to sacrifice my son. Follow me as we as we get dive into this story as the plot gets thick tonight. We're talking about how fancy God is tonight. As I read Psalms 40, verse 7, and it reads, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Hebrews back sums up in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So all the way through the pages of time, the Bible is talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, that is the true prophet, prophetic message of the hour. See, the prophetic message is not about a house and, and a car and having a wife or having a husband or having that fancy job. The prophetic dealt with the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you follow me tonight, you'll begin to see Jesus Christ walks all the way from the beginning of time to the age of grace. In Psalms chapter 22, David, and you got to read the whole chapter, David in Psalms 22, he gives you a description of the cross 2,000 years before Christ even comes on scene. Not only that, Daniel the prophet backs him up. As we go into Isaiah, Isaiah 53, chapter 5, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, verse 5 reads, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. See, Isaiah even talks about the cross. And he talks about Christ's crucifixion on the cross. But not only that, Isaiah gets more detail in Christ coming to rule with the nation of Israel on planet Earth. As you get down into the study of Isaiah. But not only that, he tells you that when Christ comes back, he's going to set up a righteous government. See, we're looking for a righteous government now. We, we're talking about the injustices that's out there. And, and we're talking about the post 
police and we, we're talking about the Republicans and, and the Democrats just won't get it right. So we look into the liberals and the liberal just don't have the answer. And then we run to the police and even the police, they're not perfect in today's world. But Isaiah talks about a perfect government which Christ rules with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel will rule here on planet Earth judging what the 12 apostles will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Follow me now as I walk you through the through time as we see Christ, Christ come through the scriptures tonight. Oh, he fancy because he had a plan. So he's so fancy that in Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43, there were some thieves that was on the cross next to him. And, and, and I'm paraphrasing, like I said tonight, and, and, and when you get into Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through 43, the, the thief, only thing he asked was that he had that eternal salvation. And you really think about it like, wow, this thief, he wasn't baptized. He was a sinner. And he was right there on the cross. And, and Christ was so fancy that he said, look, when you're going to reign in eternity with me, you're going to be there in eternity, inter eternity with me. And you may say, wow, this guy wasn't even baptized. But that's a whole different story because it shows you the power of the cross that Christ was so powerful that you didn't even have to be baptized to be saved. As we, as we read on in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, and, and, and Christ tells you, look how fancy he is. Look how awesome he is. Let, let's read what he tells them in Matthew 26, verse 53. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled that thus it must be? So here it is, Christ. He's on the cross, and he's letting them know, look, I could stop the whole show right now. I could call down my father, and he'll send me six legions, he'll send me 12 legions of angels. And if you do your study of the Bible, 12 legions of angels, each legion was 6,000 angels. So you would have had a, a total of 72,000 angels that could have came down out of heaven and stopped the whole show. Oh, we're talking about he fancy tonight. Look how great God is. So we see God walks through time and he walks through history and he tells you, lo, I come in the volume of the books. You see him on the cross and you see two men, two thieves on the cross next to him. They get saved. Look at that eternal salvation. But not only that. Christ tell you, look, it ain't, it ain't no power given except to be given from above. He tells you, I can stop the whole show and I can just bring 72,000 angels down and they can stop the whole show. But no, it gets a little deeper than that as we go on. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, and it reads, Let this mind be in you, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. As I read verse 8, and being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See, Christ came to fulfill the scriptures and he could have stopped the whole show. I just showed you that. But he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So it shows you how God, how fancy he was, how he loved mankind, how he gave his life for mankind. But as I read verse 9, it reads, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, God has exalted his son, and there's no other name given among men whereby you must be saved in the age of grace or any other age. So we thank God for what he's doing in this particular hour. So you, so you look at Christ and you see that he came obedient unto the cross because he came to save humanity. He came to save us as sinners, those that are not perfect. As I read on, first, second Corinthians chapter five, verse 20 through 21 reads, now then we are ambassadors of Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Let me show you how fancy he was. Let me show you how awesome God is. 
It reads, for he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now we see, look at here, that not only did he go, was obedient into death, but this man was perfect. The Bible said he had no sin, but he became sin for us. Look at the love of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 25 backs me up. It said, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Look at Christ suffering. We don't even want to suffer. But Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice. I always say Paul talked about the things he went through. He said it was light afflictions compared to what Christ went through. All the things Paul went through, Paul said, it'll never compare to the things that Christ went through. Verse 22 reads, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. So the Bible said, look, this guy didn't even sin. Look at God, the righteous one. And it said there was no gal found in his mouth. That means there was no deceit. There was no mischief. He had no hidden agenda. Oh, he's fancy tonight, church. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So he, God said, look, you know what? I ain't going to judge nobody. I ain't going to fight with nobody because I have a father who is the ultimate judge, and he's going to come back, and he's going to judge all things. Look at the example he was for us. As I read verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are, not, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Oh, church, he's fancy tonight as we, as, as we carry on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, it reads, How about we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world that come to naught. See, we ain't speaking wisdom of this world. You know, I, I, when we teach our messages and, and people got something to say, the world come into the church venues or they come into the church and, and, tr and try to comprehend what we're talking about. See, that's the wisdom of the world. When I talk about the dietary law, that's the, that's the wisdom of the world. See, the wisdom I'm giving you is eternal wisdom from the book of God, the word of God, which is the Bible. That's an everlasting word. I read, as I read verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here Paul tells you. See, God was so smart. Let me show you how smart he was. He came through the pages of time. As we see, he saved the men on the cross. Uh, that was that was hanging on the cross next to him, the thieves. Not only that, as we look into it, he tells us, look, I could have stopped the whole show with the legion of angels. Not only that, when they killed them, he rose again the third day with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Oh, look how fancy God was. And, and you look at him and, and you see the greatness of God. And then as we study, we found out there was no mischief in him. There, there was no guile in him. And see, Satan thought he had God. And as we read it, and as I read verse 8 again, and I like this here, because as I explain it, I got to explain it because it's so heavy, you really think about it. Verse 8, I'm talking about he fancy tonight. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. See, they did not know that salvation would come through Jesus Christ. See, they knew, and Satan knew throughout the times he was coming through the pages of time. But he did not know that Jesus Christ would be the perfect sacrifice for all humanity. And that's why I say if they would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, if Satan would have known the ultimate purpose of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, he would not have killed Christ. And if he, if he wouldn't have killed Christ, then we wouldn't have no hope. See, he got Satan, he called Satan in his wisdom. See, Satan thought he was wiser than God. But God shows Satan that, look, you ain't wiser than me. So when they thought they killed Christ, 
They was joyous and, and Satan them thought they had a victory. But never knowing that, the, that it was all planned out, God had already planned it out from the beginning of time. Oh, he was fancy. And what we say is fancy was to elaborate and structure or decoration. So God had structure and order. He knew they was going to kill him. And they thought they had him. And he, he let them take him to the cross. Them, the evil people, Satan, not knowing that Christ's death was the answer to all humanity. That Christ would be the perfect sacrifice for all of humanity. They thought they had him. They thought they killed him. He rose again the third day, not understanding that Christ was the perfect sacrifice for all of humanity. And Christ today under the age of grace asked us to do one thing. He don't ask us to go out and sacrifice bullocks. He don't ask us to go down to the box at Obed Edom's house to be saved. We don't have to go to Jerusalem every year for Pentecost to be saved anymore because Christ came and fulfilled the righteousness of the law. We don't have to be baptized according to Acts 2.38 because we are under the age of grace. So we thank God for his word as I get ready to close this out. In, in, in John chapter 3 verse 16. And it tells you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. God wants each and every one of us to, of, I'm sorry, God wants each and every one of us to have the eternal salvation. And the only thing God won't ask us to do is to believe. For by, for by grace are you saved, not of works. It is the gift of God. So when I say not of works, that means you can't work for grace. I don't care. I, you don't drink. Oh, that's good. You don't smoke. That's good. You don't fornicate. That's great. You don't do this and you don't do that. That's excellent. But your works will not get you into heaven. What will get you into heaven? Believing in what God did for us each on the cross. For it tells you it's a gift to God. What is a gift? A gift is something that's given to each and every one of us freely. You don't pay for a gift. You ever paid for a gift? I ain't never paid for a gift. If you didn't pay for it, it ain't a gift. So a gift is something given to us freely. So God has given us this thing called salvation freely. And the only thing he asked that we believe in what he did for us on the cross. So we thank God that Satan, they killed him on the cross. We sure do. Because if they went ahead, crucified him, killed him, we today would not have hope in the age of grace. So he did us a favor. He gave us, he did us, the body of Christ, a favor when he crucified Christ. But now we have eternal salvation. Now the only thing we have to do is just believe in what Christ did for us on the cross. So God, yes, he is fancy. He's awesome. He's wonderful. It's not about us, but it's about him. It's about the things that he do each and every day for us. It's about acknowledging the small things in our life. Whether we have the job, whether we have the car, whether we have all these materialistic things that's going to vanish, we got to look at the source. So you want to see how fancy God is? When you leave your home tomorrow, when you go to work tonight, look around. Look at the planes flying in the air. Look at the, all the technology that's out there. Look at the internet, look at your home, look at your family, and you'll see how God, how fancy God is. Something, sometimes we, we neglect the very small and minute things, and we don't appreciate the small things. We all guilty of this. Uh, each message I teach starts with me first as a member of the body of Christ. As I get ready to close out, please like our page, subscribe down below. Um, you can follow us on Facebook at Farming Hill, at, uh, Contemporary Living with Farming Hill. Also, like I said before, if you're in the Chicagoland area, you, if you got Comcast in the south suburbs, you can tune in to Contemporary Living with Farming Hill each and every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. As I get ready to close out tonight, we thank God for his unmerited, undeserving favor called grace. For grace is the, to is the total absence of any works. You can't work for grace. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. You can't tarry for it. It is simply what God has given to each and every one of us. Because we believe that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day for our justification. On behalf of myself, my lovely wife over there in the corner, and contemporary living, be blessed.